Hey, hi everybody, how are you? I hope everybody is doing well tonight. Oh my gosh, it is warm in the studio. Warm in here. Warm, warm, warm. Turn my heater down. We moved a couple things. <clears throat> I'll show you over here. I moved, see this bookcase right here? What we did was, hey George, how are you? Nice to have you here. Um, we took that and shoved it up to the ceiling so that, uh, and then put brackets to hang it on so that it then cleared the space heater down there or the cadet heater. So we could deal with the heat and the electrical issues in here. And uh, it's working really well, <laughs> almost too well, seriously. <laughs> and so it's toasty warm in here. And, but it's great to have a warm welcome for everybody. Get that, a warm welcome. Yeah. Oh, Gretchen, Gretchen, bad. Let's see. My sound's up? Yeah, that's up. Um, <laughs> so Linda is here, my wonderful moderator. Yay, Linda, how are you? And Tamara's here. Yes, Linda. I think Tamara's got a wrench too. Tamara's the moderator. Yay. Um, so bucket fillers are in the house. George is here. George is part of my Ecamm fam and, um, and all that wonderful crowd of people. Um, George, we call, I call this group the bucket filling brigade because the things that we read and the stories and the art we share just helps to fill our buckets and others' buckets. And that's kind of what we want to do on this channel is fill each other's buckets and fill others, whoever stops by. So, um, oh, Fatima's here. Hey, Travel Dreamer. I just saw Sonia. I, I missed it. We were doing some other thing. Sonia had posted something on her channel uh, about a painting and uh, her Garden State painting channel. And she said, it's Fatima's fault. And I want to know what it was. I'm going to have to go back and look because I don't know what you caused, girl, but you caused Sonia to have to do something. That's crazy. Um, anyway, and who else is here? George. <laughs> I'm glad you like that intro. Um, yes, dad jokes and puns tonight. <laughs> yeah, well... Yeah, it is. It is that kind of oh, man. What a day! Um, very cool. Yes, we are family here. It is. So you guys, uh, I got. Look at this. I got some soft pastels. I went to an art store. I'm. Uh, I've avoided getting soft pastels like crazy. I haven't even opened them yet. Hmm. So maybe I'll have to open them on Sunday or something. I'll do something else. So she said, Linda says, uh, that's because Fatima suggested an idea for Sonia on Anthony's channel chat. Oh, Anthony was doing that starburst and um, George Anthony is grayscale painting and Sonia is garden state painting. Both artists, wonderful artists. Um, Sonia also has RBDJ um, and does a lot of lives, but... <clears throat> um, uh, Anthony was live painting today a starburst and I caught bits and pieces of it but we were doing something else that I'll have to uh, I'll tell you guys about on Sunday if it comes through oh my gosh <laughs> crazy just just let's say the George the, the, George will appreciate this completely because this is the nickname that doc gave me this is a true gangsta grandma move that i'm doing and i'll tell you about it on sunday yeah so whew. the rv dj has blenda issues <laughs> yes she does she does okay so tonight you guys i have two books and if you saw on that opening um that it was all about math and a woman and vibrations. And the story I have tonight is about a woman who is very significant in the mathematical world. But before I get to that, um, I wanted to share this book that I've been 
swearing I was going to share and I'm going to, oh, hang on. This camera up overhead is just blinking on me. So I am going to maybe, 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 maybe not, maybe not. Okay. It is being, um, clicky on me. Oh, fiddlestick. All right. All right. So hang on for just a second. Okay, you guys, this is going to be a quick, um, have to do instead because this camera up above, which is my old iPhone has decided it doesn't want to behave very often. So what I'm doing is going to pop up my regular phone in as a continuity camera, maybe, and see if I can get it to uh, behave. There we go. iPhone. There we go. Uh, iPhone camera. There we go. Okay. Yay. Now I'm going to have to hang on. Let me put the on preview mode so you guys don't see me mess around. Well, hey, there, <laughs> there's Larry's here. Um, you know what? I don't care if you see me mess around. Back to live mode because you can see me do this. Back to live mode and there we go. Um, all right. So what I need to do, because I want to show you this book because, hey, Angie's here too. Larry and Angie are here. Nice. Great. Um, I want to show you this book called Women Artists A to Z. And it, I do not have uh, it in, see, and I just changed cameras. So everything's all gabooey. And so now you get to see on my messy desk. Oh, George, do not tell on me. Um, but that's the way of the world. And so let's go to uh, zoom it in further. Well, come on. Oh, it's not going to zoom me. Okay, I'll bring you down. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. There. Maybe you can see now. Ho. Oh. See, the other camera, I had it all set up perfectly, and then it decided it didn't want to behave. Okay, well, we're not going to read a lot of this book, but I can still show you some of this. There we go. Get my keyboard out of your way. Get my notes on the side. You guys get to see all, spill all the tea. All right. Um, here we go. Let's go to here. And... If I don't zoom it, oh, I'll zoom it there. Okay, then zoom. All right, that's what we're going to do. So this is the book, Women Artists A to Z, and I mentioned it the other day. And it was one that I really wanted to show you because it, it just brought people from all over. And um, it, it just, it's by Melanie Labarge and illustrated by Carolyn Corrigan and has... Carolyn Corrigan did a lot of it in, um, it almost looks like, um, collage, but it's also print work, I believe. Let's see. Oh, tiny writing. Where's my loop? Um, art for this book was created digitally, but it's made to look a lot, some of it like collage. So A is for angel has Merka, um, an uh, author here, Merka, or an artist, Merka Mora. B is for box. Betty Saar it is best known for assembling materials within a box. What a good idea. She filled the boxes with personal treasures and found objects in order to tell stories, celebrate black history and culture, and to confront and examine racist stereotypes and images. So she put them in a box. Not now. I don't want to. <laughs> Just ask me if I wanted to install an update. Really? Really? C is for color. Helen Frankenthaler. Uh, Helen created pieces called color field paintings, large as fields and full of color. Instead of painting on an easel, she tried something new, laying the canvas on a floor and soaking it in flowing paints that seeped into the fabric. 
Doesn't that sound like fun? Oh my gosh. D is for dots. Oh, I read the book about this. You guys know about this, Iaya Kuzama. I read a book about her, what she does. She's so amazing. E is for eggs. K. Sage was a surrealist painter, meaning she showed ordinary things in a way that is new or unfamiliar. She often put eggs in paintings of landscapes and buildings. Eggs in the hallway. A giant egg leaning on the stairs. Now that's surreal. Yeah. <laughs> put eggs in the hallway. Do you remember that? Uh, the... Do you guys ever remember the book about Ramona? Ramona by Beverly Cleary. And they did a, like a Saturday show of Ramona one day, a little, like a, a short show, like a little movie. And Ramona's mom always packed a hard boiled egg in her lunch or had them marked in the, in the refrigerator and which ones were hard. And Ramona one day grabbed the wrong one and she cracked the egg on her forehead on the bus on the way to school and it went all down her face. Oh, I remember so much. F is for flower. George O'Keefe. Oh, my all time. One of my favorites. Captivated the world with her flowers. She would paint the same flower over and over, bigger and bigger, closer and closer. Her art shows us how to look deeply at everything and to see nature in a whole new way. G is for grid. Agnes was inspired by a vision to make grid paintings. She used rulers to draw rectangles in pencil across the surface of her painted square canvases. Many of her grids were so big that she had to use a ladder to reach them. I think what I like about this book is the different ideas, like the grid work. Like I did a drawing the other day and just hashed, like in, in hash marks, like um, Maurice Sendak used in his. And I thought, oh, I wonder you know, how does that work? Could that, could, um, you, you know, how, what kind of painting would I get? So H is for horse. Hmm. One quick to see Smith. One is art confronts the mistreatment of indigenous people and land in the United States. She often includes horses as both a personal symbol. Her father was a horse trader and a political one, reminding us of the ties between humans and nature. Wow. I is for ink. Elizabeth Catlett. Elizabeth painted art in many forms, from screen prints to sculptures to line of cuts that used ink. She often centered the experiences of women and children sculpting and stamping images of African-American imagination, activism, and love into art. So it would be really cool if you guys, you know, if one of these ideas inspired you to try something new or different or just, hmm, maybe it'll have something I can figure out to do with soft pastels. J is for Jolly. Judith Leister. Judith was a painter more than 300 years ago. Whoa. Many thought her Jolly paintings had been made by men. Hmm because working female artists were so rare at the time. It's easy to spot her work, though. She also painted a star into her signature. That's cool. You can see it. Beep, beep, beep. I come up. There. You can see the little star in her signature. Ooh, very cool. K is for kitchen. Leonora Carrington. Leonora's parent paintings of magical, mythical creatures began in the kitchen. She mixed eggs and pigment to make a paint called egg tempera. Yeah, haven't we all done that? Just like a chef or a scientist, Leonora loved transforming ordinary ingredients into something magnificent. I love that. L is for line. <clears throat> Carmen Herrera. Carmen paints large blocks of color side by side onto canvases so that in the space where the two colors meet, line comes to life. She spent more than 10 years painting a series with only white and green called Blanco y Verde. 10 years, white and green only. Oh. <laughs> All right. You know, I think of the times and I think, I don't know what to, I don't, I'm not inspired. I don't know what to, I don't know what to draw. I don't know what to, 
it, 10 years with two colors. Seriously, I need to not whine. No whining. M is for marble. Edmonia Lewis. Edmonia, what a name, Edmonia, sculpted mountains of marble into smooth, life-size human figures. While perfecting class technique, classic techniques of sculpture, she carved out the stories of Native Americans and newly freed Africans and West Indians. Wow. Yeah, thanks, Linda, for posting those links. Um, <laughs> you conjured up Anthony. <laughs> hey, better be careful, Anthony. Linda has that kind of magical thing. She just posts you and there you appear. Welcome, by the way. Welcome. Um, N is for nature. Maya Lin, you probably know who Maya Lin is, uses natural materials, often recycled, such as glass, metal, wood, and dirt. Her work helps us think about our environment by resizing and reimagining parts of, the, of nature, such as when she constructed a whole field of rolling hills to mirror the ocean's wave. I think she was also... Wasn't she the designer of the Vietnam Memorial? Tell me if I'm wrong, but didn't Maya Lin do the Vietnam Memorial too? I think so. O is for opposites. Hilma A. F. Clint. Hilma was always trying to paint the unseen from the tiniest parts of life, like the cells we are made up of, to the expansive energy of the universe. Oh. Many of her paintings contain the balance of opposites, light and dark, small and large, up and down. I like that. P is for pottery. Maria Martinez. Maria molded coils of clay into both beautifully delicate and strong pieces of pottery. The black on black designs was part of her San Id Il Defonso Pueblo's community tradition in which shapes and mythical creatures appear in the shiny glaze painted on the darkened clay. I love that kind of pottery. Ah, Q is for quilt. G's Bend. The G's Bend Collective doesn't refer to one artist, but to the many generations of African-American women in G's Bend, Alabama. They gather to weave community and geometry into modern art quilts that grace clotheslines and museum walls. Those people that use math. Oh. R is for roots. Frida Kahlo. Frida made paintings that were small in scale but very large in impact. She created colorful and revolutionary self-portraits filled with an Im imagery rooted in her Mexican identity and culture and influenced by the indigenous roots of Mexico. I love Frida Kahlo's work. I, there was, when we were in Oaxaca in 2022, yeah, um, there was in the Zocalo in the downtown, which is the historic area of Oaxaca, there was a Frida Kahlo gallery. Oh my gosh, <clears throat> it was beautiful. Oh, there he is, she is, Louise Bourgeois. S is for spider. Louise's large metal spider sculptures are lovingly called maman, the French word for mother, in honor of her own maman, Josephine. Louise spent so many years of her life making spiders, both big and small, that she is often referred to as Spider Woman. I would love to see this in person. It's ginormous from what I understand, the pictures I've seen. T is for technique. <laughs> Thanks, George. Louis Malo Jones. Louis used a, a multitude of techniques to make art. She designed vibrant textiles, painted realistic portraits, watercolored cityscapes and landscapes, and collaged abstract paintings. Ah, with African and Haitian imagery. As a teacher, she also encouraged generations of artists to try their own different approaches. Okay. Um, except for the African American and Haitian part, that's a lot like what I do. <laughs> except she does it really well. I just play, which is fine. You is for unique. Alice Neal. Alice painted friends, family, and neighbors, capturing each person's unique 
energy, and style. Unlike many artists of her era who focused on abstract work, she chose to create portraits that allowed each individual's personality to come through with her one-of-a-kind style of painting. That's cool. Beautiful. V is for Veil, Helen Zouab. Helen paints women wearing the abaya, a veiled garment worn by some Muslim women in much of her work. She often reimagines famous pieces of Western art by including Eastern imagery to create a dialogue between cultures that moves beyond stereotypes. Oh, how wonderful. W is for wood. There was a, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched on this. Reminds me, uh, there was a season on Project Runway where there was one of the designers, I think it was Project Runway, was Muslim. And she, all of her work that she did, she designed with um, that in mind, with the headpieces in mind. And oh, it's just beautiful work. W is for wood. Ursula von Reidingsbard. Ursula is a sculptor who has worked with cedar for many years. The pungent smell of wood lingers long after she's done sculpting it. Some of Ursula's imaginative pieces are small enough to hang on walls, while others need a wide outdoor space. Yes. X is for exposure. The amazing Dorothea Lang. Ah. Oh. I have her book up there, I think. Dorothea was a photographer known for her empath empathetic portraits. Her photos or exposures revealed the effects of poverty and inequality on families across the United States during the Great Depression. Yes, she was hired by the United States government to depict pictures of the of the um the Great Depression and she spent a lot of time in Oregon um, and here in the Northwest. It was just, oh my gosh, her work. I, I, I walked into uh, a gallery in Newport, Oregon one time, and they had an exhibit of her work. It wasn't a big advertise. I just walked in, and there was about 100 of her pieces, and I was just like, oh. Why is for yarn? Zenobia Bailey. Zenobia, gosh, if you could wear that name. Zenobia's yarn-based art weaves together the traditions of African-American, indigenous, and Eastern cultures. Her mandalas are spiraling symbols of joy, art, resilience, and our connection to one another. Hang on, my chair dropped. How did my chair drop? Whoa! <laughs> oh, my chair dropped way too far. <laughs> There. Whew. I tried to fix it and I dropped it farther. Z is for zoology. Oh. Maria Sibylla Marian. Maria collected and painted insects from a young age, creating her own view of the world and her own type of zoology. Watching a silkworm's metamorphosis from earth to sky probably helped her inspire her own transformation from artist to scientist. And then it has a little bit about each person further in depth. When they lived, Maria Zabilla Marion was from 1647 to 1717. Helen Zouab was born in 1959. Other people. Uh, gosh. Very cool. Yes. Judith Leister. The one who paint jolly folks. She was 1609 to 1660 is when she lived. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. Oh, here I am. Back. And so that was women artists, A to Z. Yeah. Um, by Melanie Labarge. And I just wanted to share that with you guys because I knew you'd enjoy it and get some inspiration from different people that we hear about and see about and all that good stuff. Hey, <laughs> yeah, Larry's saying hi. Uh, gosh, I'm going to have to jump on my notebook to fix some of these YouTube things. Oh, looks like collage. Are there YouTube things happening? <clears throat> hmm. 
Hmm. Um, George O'Keefe, yeah. She's amazing. Um, styles are amazing. I like Sundak is awesome. Angie's channel, yes. Good job. Quilts do tell an amazing story. <clears throat> Myelin was the architect. Thank you. Thank you for that. I thought it, I was right. Okay, so the next one is a little better because I have the book on Libby and you will be able to see the pictures beautifully, but I have the book here in front of me to read because then I can read it and I can just, it's just, I get to read the book that way, but you get to see the pictures better. Kind of. <laughs> um, I like spiders. Yes, their spiders are huge. I read that book about her, Larry. I mean, seriously, 20 feet tall. She's had all over the place. They're really pretty cool. Um, so, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, it, I thought it was a pretty cool book, too. I thought that was one, a good alphabet book every once in a while, especially one about artists. Who can, you know, who can beat that? A good alphabet book. All right. So the next book, though, is... Um, called Nothing Stopped Sophie. And let me get it up here. It is by Barbara McClintock. And no, it's it's written by Cheryl, I'm sorry, Cheryl Bardo. And here, let's go here. Yes. Let me move this over here so I know what you're, okay, yeah, let's see. So Cheryl Bardo, um, his little bit of bio on her here. Come on, go. She's always been curious about the world and has loved to write. As a child, she read everything, including a grandparent's old set of encyclopedias. Oh, hands up, thumbs up, show me something, put a book in the, the chat if you read the encyclopedia when you were a kid. Hello. I did. I did. We, I, oh, gosh. I loved, we had an old one. We had an old encyclopedia set that, that had been my grandmother's that was just two parts and then we got another one that had more I would I would read the encyclopedia I loved it um in the newspaper for Mother's Day when uh, my first poem was published in the newspaper for Mother's Day when I was in grammar school it read happy Mother's Day her smile is kind her eyes are blue but not all of this is completely true <laughs> p.s her eyes are green yay at the time, I didn't understand why everybody thought this poem was so funny. Thankfully, I've learned a lot about more about writing so that I no longer have to end the poem with po end with postscripts. Now I focus on telling the heart of the story rather than trying to make words fit into the arbitrary rules. Uh, um, my books for young readers are adventures that explore the world around us. Sophie Germain didn't fly to the moon and Gregor Mendel didn't climb Mount Everest, but mathematicians, scientists, historians, and artists understand that each day can be an adventure if we look closely and question the mysteries of everyday life. Uh, she goes on, I love nurturing young readers' curiosity, confidence in themselves as writers. In addition to my books, I engage students at schools and libraries. Sometimes I teach summer writing workshops for middle school students. I did that. We do things like eat popcorn and then write poems about it. Or we catch tadpoles and then write scenes where, about werewolves wading in creeks. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> also worked with students with learning differences. A theme of my teaching and author visits is that every student can be a writer and take pride in having a unique voice. So she, for many years, she's lived in Chicago eating deep dish pizza and working in the Field Museum, which is one of the world's top museums of natural history. She now lives in Connecticut with her math teacher husband and two kids and a deaf cat named Zeus. So that is, and she's done the other books that she's done. Uh, oh, it just has a list. Her other books are Nothing Stops Sophie, which I'm going to read, Bebe Goes Home, Gregor Mendel, That Friar Who Grew Peas, China, A History, Behold the Beautiful Dung Beetle. Yes, she wrote a book about dung beetles. Mammoth and Mans Mastodons, An Ugly Duckling Dinosaur. <laughs> um, so that is, she is the author of the book that I'm going to be reading tonight. And the illustrator is the... One and only. Amazing. Uh, incomparable to believe. Barbara McClintock. 
Oh my gosh. Um, I'll click right here on her books first and what she's, how it kind of goes on and on and on and on and on. How many may out there remember the old Fraggle Rock, Jim Henson's Fraggle Rock series? She was the illustrator for the Fraggle Rock books out. A Tale of Two Bad Mice, The White Cat, Pot-Bellied Possums, Little Red Hen. She did some of those. Oh, Christmas Gang. I mean, The Revolt of the Teddy Bears. All these. Little Lit, Rebecca, House of Dolls. When Mindy Saved Hanukkah, The Frog Prince. She just The Tale of Tricky Fox. I remember this. Uh, I think it was a Caldecott nominee. Goldilocks and the Three Bears, The Mitten, Gingerbread Man, they're all really amazing, amazing. Um, she's done so many books, but let's pull about here. She is an award-winning book author and illustrator. She draws like a dream. This is what uh, somebody from Booklist said. Her beautifully res restrained use of color may evoke a long time ago, but her com compositions are so dynamic that there's always something for contemporary children to discover. Um, she's an American illustrator and author of over 40 books for children. Her books have received numerous awards and citations, including a New York Times Best Illustrated Picture Book Award, four ALA Notable, that's the American Library Association Notable Book Citations, a Boston Globe Horn Book Honor Award, which that is a tough one to get, a China Times Best Illustrated Book Award and British Fantasy for one, uh, and a British Fantasy Award one of and one of her books is a best-selling title in Japan. Her artwork has been exhibited, and is in the collection of libraries, museums, and galleries around the world. She's lectured about her work nationally and internationally, and is currently teaching classes on creating children's books at Wesleyan University. She served on the board of directors of the Eric Carle Museum, where I went and I, uh, and chaired the original art show at the Society of Illustrators. Oh. Self she's self-educated as an illustrator, learning by studying and copying artwork from books checked out at public libraries, yay! Originally from New Jersey and North Dakota, she now resides in Northeastern Connecticut with her partner and illustrator, David Johnson, and their three overly helpful cats. And that's Barbara McClintock. She has so many things. Just an amazing illustrator. But the book I'm going to read for you tonight is Nothing Stopped Sophie. The story of the unshakable mathematician Sophie Germain. Now, yeah, that'll get. A, I'm going to open my book. Follow along here. Long ago in Paris, a young girl named Sophie Germain understood that math could do more than measure lengths of silk and tally accounts in her father's shop. In those days, people scoffed at girls for thinking about anything more serious than hair ribbons or what music to play on the pianoforte. But nothing stopped Sophie. Telling Sophie not to think about math was like telling a bird not to soar. Ideas came to Sophie day and night, and she sneaked out of bed to study math while others slept. Monsieur and Madame Germain worried that being smart would bring their daughter heartbreak and scorn. So they seized Sophie's candles. They stopped lighting fires in her room. And they snatched away her warm dresses, desperate to make her stay tucked into bed. Still, nothing stopped Sophie. One morning, Sophie was found bundled in blankets, asleep at her desk next to a pot of ink that had frozen solid. Finally, Sophie's parents let their daughter indulge her mathematical dreams. 
For a girl to become a mathematician would be impossible anyway. Sophie grew up during the French Revolution, when starving peasants rioted against rich kings and nobles who feared on, feasted on sausages, salads, and sweets. When the streets were unsafe outdoors, Sophie's parents kept her indoors. As cries for equality echoed from the roof tiles, she cherished how math could make sense of the world. Math, with its clear and simple laws. Math, with its strong sense of order. Math, which defines when the world is in balance. Curled up in her father's library, Sophie barely heard the distant cannons that rattled the shutters. Sophie discovered that mathematicians use numbers as poets use letters, as a language to question, explore, and solve the secrets of the universe. She read how ancient Greeks wrote equations that made the impossible possible. Water flowed uphill, a lone man might pulled mighty ships ashore, a scholar measured the size of the earth. Sophie longed to become a mathematician and write such poems of her own. By the time Sophie was 19, the French Revolution had simmered down and it was safe to walk the streets of Paris again. Sophie wanted to attend a university, but no professor would read a woman's work. So she secretly acquired notes from math classes and sent in homework by mail. She signed her papers, Monsieur Leblanc. Then one day, a knock came at the door. Professor Joseph Louis Lagrange had come to meet the mysterious student who sent in extraordinary homework without coming to class. We'll never know who received the greater shock. Professor Lagrange could not have guessed that Monsieur Leblanc was a modest young lady in a ruffled blouse with a dark hair in a top knot, and Sophie could not have imagined a visit from a world famous scholar. Was her dream about to take flight? With Sophie's secret discovered, news of the girl prodigy rippled through Paris. Gossips couldn't imagine a girl so smart until they met her themselves. And soon Sophie's calendar swelled with dinner parties. She knew, she hardly knew what to say in these stuffy drawing rooms, surrounded by gawkers and finery. She ached to talk seriously about math, yet no mathematician would ta take a young lady truly under his wing. Still, nothing stopped Sophie. She kept up her studies. She seized every chance to chat with scholars at luncheons and in salons. Under her pen name, she wrote to one of the most brilliant mathematicians ever. Carl Friedrich Gauss even wrote back, but his letters stopped coming soon after he discovered that Monsieur Leblanc was a woman. At age 32, Sophie witnessed an experiment that revealed the hidden laws of math at work in our everyday world. She saw a scientist sprinkle sand into a onto a glass plate. As he rubbed a violin bow against the plate's edge, vibrations shook the glass until it rang out with sound. Astonished, Sophie watched the sand dance across the plate. It formed circles, then diamonds, then figure eights. The higher the note, the more quickly the vibrations shook the plate and the more intricate the sand's pattern became. Suddenly, Sophie realized that every hand knocking on a door, her own boots clicking along the cobblestones, every motion 
sent vibrations surging through nearby objects just as waves flowed through water. The rest of Paris was agog too. The prestigious Academy of Sciences offered a medal worth 3,000 francs to anyone who could find a mathematical formula that would predict patterns of vibration. This information could affect buildings, bridges, and who knew what else? How much vibration was too much? At what point would an object break? Academy scholars called the problem impossible. Their heads spun just thinking about the many ways vibrations might move an object. But nothing stopped Sophie. Just as math measures how bird wings move up and down during flight, Sophie knew math could measure a surface moving up and down from vibration. She made her best guesses at what would affect this movement. Then she added and subtracted and multiplied and divided. And Sophie spent two years trying numbers in different combinations to write her equations. Then she submitted her work to the Academy, and this time Sophie used her own name. Sophie's work sent shockwaves through Paris. The contest had received only one entry, and it had come from a woman. Yet Sophie's solution was incorrect. When the Academy extended the contest, Sophie returned to work. For two more years, she tested her predictions by, by, by vibrating sand on plates. Finally, after thousands of calculations, the sand moved just how Sophie's numbers foretold. Her equation was as precise and eloquent as a poem. Sophie submitted the only entry to the Academy again. This time, scholars agreed that her equation was correct, but they rejected her explanation for why it worked. Still nothing stopped Sophie. She revised her research and submitted it to the Academy one more time. In 1816, Sophie Germain became the first woman to win a grand prize from the Royal Academy of Sciences. After six years, she had shaken the Academy enough to shatter its resistance. No one could deny that she was a mathematician now. The human spirit, she later reflected, requires more resources inside when outside it has less. After Sophie's work, mathematicians sought even better ways to predict vibration patterns. Eventually, their discoveries made it possible to build the Eiffel Tower in Paris and modern skyscrapers and lengthy bridges all over the world. Sophie is celebrated today because nothing stopped her. Her fearlessness and perseverance have inspired many people. Perhaps she will also inspire you. And it says more about Sophie in the back here. I'll leave that page up for you to see. The French Revolution was a turbulent time to be a teenager. The middle and lower classes of French society no longer trusted the rich nobles and royal families to look out for them, and they wanted to say in governing themselves. Rage at high taxes and widespread famine read, ran so high that no one was truly safe. Sometimes people were beaten in the streets just for not wearing the red, white, and blue. That was a symbol of revolutions. The king and queen resisted change until their own subjects executed them in 1793. 
By the time Sophie was 19, she had lived under at least four different kinds of governments, and thousands of people had lost their heads at the, in the guillotine for angering one side or another. Amid this bloodshed was exciting talk of equality and liberty, yet women did not receive the right to vote as citizens in any of the new governments that evolved. Most girls at Sophie's time did not go to school and were lucky to have they re if they received an education at home. Indeed, any woman who expressed herself to an intellectual risked becoming the target of gossip and ridicule, although expectations were slowly changing. When Sophie's mathematical talents became known, her gentleness and modest manners saved her from becoming a social outcast. Sophie never married and devoted her life to math. In addition to her work on vibration, Sophie is one of the few people to have made progress on another impossible problem. Around 1630, a mathematician named Pierre de Fermont stated that a specific kind of equation would not work for any number other than one or two, but he had no proof. Sophie was the first mathematician to prove his theory correct for a large group of numbers, which ever since have been called Sophie Germain prime numbers. Sophie's notebooks show how she hoped one day to solve the entire puzzle. Perhaps she would have succeeded if she had not died from breast cancer at the age of 55. The puzzle called Fermat's Last Theorem was finally proven in 1994. Hello. She worked on it in the early 1800s. Um, science and math are deeply connected. Is this math or science? The sand that Sophie watched dancing across the glass plate was bouncing off the places that moved the most and resting in the places that stayed almost still. We often study vibration and sound waves as part of physics, which is the science of how things move. Yet without numbers to measure, describe, and define relationships, our understanding of physics would not be very useful. We know, for example... That threading a rope over a wheel to form a pulley makes it easier to move heavy objects. Without math, however, the Greek mathematician Archimedes would not have known how many pulley wheels and what length of rope were needed for a single person to pull a boat ashore. With math, we can use an equation to figure out how much extra force a pulley adds when we pull on the rope. In the same way, Sophie's equation described the relationship between the factors that influence the vibrations goes on talk and has um, all of the different things. <laughs> that Barbara McClintock says about being approached that she says, when I was approached to illustrate nothing stop Sophie, I was terrified. I was an abysmal math student. <laughs> and the thought of illustrating a book about a brilliant mathematician was ironic at best. Once I became involved in the work, though, I noticed parallels between Sophie and myself and found ways to approach the project that married the mathematical with the artistic. The first step was to take a non-literal visual approach to the story. The manuscript inspired me to use colorful markers, gouache and collage techniques, new to me and thrilling to explore. I wanted to reference Sophie's work on patterns of vibration and to echo Cheryl Bardot's allusions to vibration and motion in the text. I envisioned numbers swirling around Sophie, bright and joyful, but also cocooning her from gawking gossips at, the par at a party, which she did that one. That's that back, like the math around there, how she has it at the party. Here. There it's cocooning her. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and I found a link between us. I am self taught as an artist. Um, she said it was during the French Revolution, Sophie became fascinated with the work of Archimedes, teaching herself calculus, Greek and Latin. And I found a link between us. I'm self taught as an artist. I also felt the awkwardness of being at a party and no one I could talk to about my work. 
Taking a non-literal approach also f allowed me to illustrate certain moments, such as Sophie winning the Academy's prize in a conceptual way. My research revealed that she didn't receive the award in person. In fact, women were only allowed into the Academy building accompanied by their mathematician and scientist husbands. Sophie's winning formula flows out of her pen around an all-male member of the Academy. I think that's... Oops. Not there, not there. Yes. Um, and she gets the award. That must be... Oh, there it is. Yes, she's, she's standing on the steps of the Academy and the math is flowing out of her pen here, and there's the all-male members of the Academy watching. That's very cool. Um, similarly, in the scenes where Sophie witnesses the experiment with sand initially, I've drawn loops of figure eights and simple diamonds, but when a friend sent me a helpful videos and photos of the Klondi paint patterns, I ended up incorporating those more accurate shapes into the illustration. I also played with the vibration motif in the image of the newspaper boy yelling out the headline, his shouts bending buildings and sending a cloud of birds tum... All right, where did it go? There it is. And sending a cloud of birds tumbling through the air and on the next page, double page spread, reinforcing the storage imagery of birds of flight. My profound thanks go to, into the um, editor. So I love how she incorporated all of those things. Oh, my gosh. And to the research that she did to make that. And there's the, the next day page. The birds come are onto the page. They continue on. All her thinking ways as she spent those six years figuring it out. Oh, my gosh. And sending it off. Look at that. That is so cool. So cool. Nothing stopped, stopped, stopped. Nothing stopped Sophie. The story of unshakable mathematician Sophie Germain. Wow. That was a good one. I like that one a lot. A lot. Good book. Just the whole integration of the art and, and the whole story of her, just just the right amount, um, and how she, I, I, too, that she used um, pro, um, art mediums that she hadn't that were new to her, and that pushed her to kind of incorporate the way Sophie felt about going into uncharted and trying new things. I think that's just, oh, yeah, that's amazing. Oh, so that's my stories for tonight, you guys. Um, I'm glad I didn't tip this over. Well, I have um, got that done. Send in your artwork for Sunday. It will be fun to show what you've got. Anybody, anybody who tries something new. I was scribbling last. I I bought some impasto. I put it on paper and then I scribbled over it. That was kind of weird. Um, and I have no idea how to use it, but I'm just I just scooped it up and slapped it down and squished it around and let it dry and then came back the next day and went, oh look at that. Um, and what else? Um, so Sunday, story and art. Monday, I go to Phoenix. Bob will be here. So next Thursday, a week from tonight, I'll be broadcasting from Phoenix. I'll be at Layla and Lachlan's. Um, and so that'll be fun. And then pretty back to normal for a little bit. But come Sunday... And we'll have a great story and art. Send in your artwork. I want to see what you're doing. See what kind of new things are going on. Uh, uh, and Anthony, sends, Anthony and Larry and Angie and Tamara and Fatima are all here. George, send something in too if you want to. Send it to my email. 
And uh, let's see, anybody else? I'm glad you guys like the book. It seems to have resonated with you guys, both of them. Um, women artists, A to Z, and then nothing stopped Sophie. Yeah, that's a good one. <sighs> so <clears throat> I'm going to go up upstairs. Bob and I are working on a project. Maybe I'll clean off this desk before I go upstairs. Probably a good idea. And until next time, everybody, you guys take care. And thanks for filling my bucket tonight. And keep looking for the beauty hidden in plain sight. It's all around you. But the first place you'll find it is when you go look in your mirror. And I'll see you Sunday. <laughs> Good, big fan.